Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are glad uh, to welcome you here tonight uh, at uh, America House. I'm representing SU Kia Career Development Center. We are conducting a series of lectures aimed um, at um, career development, aimed to help you the, to choose the right path. And um, of course, it, education is uh, the, fonda the foundation for your future career. And um, today we have um, a prominent speaker we are very glad to introduce to you, um, Timofey Milovanov, who is uh, interim president of uh, Kiev School of Economics. Timofey is also a professor at the um, University of Pittsburgh, and he is also the founder of uh, analytical platform Vox Ukraine. We are anxious to listen to the future of education. Timofey, you're welcome. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I don't know anything about the future of education, and probably no one does. Um, and um, I can only try to sh share it with you my impressions from what I observe here in Ukraine and also in Europe and in the US um, about the changes in education, both from the demand perspective from the perspective of what people are looking for, as well as from the supply perspective, from the, the perspective of how the universities, companies, and individuals are trying to respond to the changes in demand. Okay. And so, what's new about the education currently in the beginning of the 21st century? People say that we have smartphones today, we have internet, uh, we have online education, we have blend education, and this is going to change the way we do education. You might or might not have heard something like that, but perhaps you might share an idea that tomorrow the notion of the university might be quite different from the notion of university we perceive it today. And I, I'm not convinced that's true. I'm not convinced that that it is true because we don't quite understand what education is and why education is important. We seem to spend a lot of money and time in Ukraine on the type of diplomas which often are nothing more than just a diploma. We basically sit for four or five years and we don't learn anything special there. That's stuff we could have learned ourselves from internet or in the library. In fact, the amount of time we actually s spend studying is often limited. We do something else there. And then we have online courses or workplace, and we go there and we find that the skills we have acquired at the university are not very useful. Now, I see you, of course. Where's the banner? Is one exception. Kiev School of Economics is another one. <laughs> Notice the <laughs> Czech flag. <laughs> plugged in the key <laughs> within 30 seconds of the speech. <laughs> but most seriously, the concern that something is fundamentally changing is, is not necessarily founded. It might be that the education is changing and the future of edu education is going to be different, but it might very well be that nothing will change. And here's my argument for this. For the last 60, 70, 80, 100 years, 
a university or a school or some kind of educational institution has been pretty much the same. It's a lecturing style. You come to the school, to the university, or to an institution, you get a curriculum, which consists of a number of courses. And then you go in the courses, and you sit for 45 minutes, for an hour, for an hour 20. You might have more courses, fewer courses. You, you might have more homework, less homework. You might have better professors, sometimes two of them teaching at the same time. Sometimes you have study groups, sometimes <coughs> you participate. But the basic unit of education today is lecturing plus homework. And exams, which wrap this up. <coughs> so it's teaching, lecturing, <coughs> and testing. And people are saying, today everything's going to be different. Today, tomorrow, we have Prometheus, we have Coursera. There's no reason for teachers anymore. Professors are concerned around the world that they will be out of jobs 20 years from now, 10 years from now, because we have video today. But video has been around for a while. And books have been around for a while. And you might very well get a better book than your teacher. In o it's often the case that the book is actually better than the deliverer of a lecture. And you can sit in a library or at home using your device and you can study from the book. Why do we need lectures? Do we really study, read the book and come to the lectures and lectures explain something different? Well, it's not often the case. Sometimes it is, but usually it's not the case. Is this a technology lecture? Is it a technology which saves us time on um, reading a book? Is this a more efficient technology of delivering knowledge to people? Well, it's not obvious because there are clearly better videos, explanatory videos, which you have to watch after a bad professor in a mediocre university tries to explain a book which he has not read very well himself. All right? And after that, you still go to that lecture, you come back home, you open YouTube, or you open Google, and try to look for a better book, for a better video, for some explanation. And yet you still go to that lecture. Sometimes you don't go to those lectures, because there's nothing you can learn from those lectures. And you still spend a semester doing something. It's not obvious what you do, because you might not attend these lectures, and then you just submit homework. Sometimes you don't submit homework. Sometimes you copy homework assignments from your friends. Sometimes you pay someone. It might be a tutor, like in the US, who will do a homework for you. Or it might be your friend or someone else, or a professor, like in Ukraine sometimes is the case. It doesn't matter who you pay to, it's just who performs the functions of submitting a problem set for you. And yet you still go and get this diploma. And yet everyone in the market knows that these diplomas are often shitty because you know there's no real knowledge behind that. Okay? And we pay a lot of money and we pay a lot of resources in terms of opportunity cost of time. We could have become Olympic athletes in five years. But yet we spend five years sitting in classes while there is better technology available to deliver that knowledge to us. So it's, we don't understand really what education is. We don't understand the purpose of lecturing, and moreover, we observe that the same technology, extremely inefficient lecturing. Inex inefficient to the extent that no one even goes to lectures anymore. Survives. That's a paradox, and that's a puzzle. So therefore, the premise that the education will change immediately or soon is not obvious. It is not obvious at all. Now let's step back for a second and ask, um, what do economists think about education? I'm an economist by training, so I'm going to give you a lecture from the perspective, by the way, a lecture. <laughs> all right? And by the way, there are better speakers. And in English, absolutely. You could have uh, watched a better lecture on YouTube from TEDx, perhaps, about the future of education. And you're sitting here. Why is that? Why are you sitting here while there are better talks, which, of course, I didn't bother looking up, okay, about education on TEDx and also in Harvard or open online courses and MIT and so on. There is research about the future of education, about trends. Economists write articles about that. You're sitting here. I'm spending my time here. What is this activity? We don't understand what it is. But the human content is important. 
The human contact is important. We cannot scale up education of children. We still have high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, where we will have one teacher and 20 students, sometimes five students, sometimes 15. We need that, even though technology is available there. As consumers, we hate when a machine talks to us, although sometimes we like it. We like maybe talking to Siri. I don't know if you like it. I don't know. It's fun. Some uh, customer service representatives really piss me off. But at the same time, when there's something non-structured, we really need a human. We don't like talking to a machine which cannot offer something. So you can argue we need a human because human will be able to answer to you, um, you know, to reflect on non-structured um, questions. Something we don't have an answer for. <laughs> something specific to you. And yet you're not asking me any questions. So I'm definitely not addressing your individual problems. So I do not know what education is and why in a hundred years the technology of education has not undergone fundamental changes. Although it should have. It might be that we're just delayed. The, the, you know, education is not business. Fundamentally, you know. It's public good provision. It's ultimately inefficient. We have to have state and funders to come in and support quality education. And therefore, there's no real pressure for introducing cutting-edge technologies. That might be the case. But then it doesn't answer any questions. Why is the education non-profit? Why are we not doing it for profit? Why it cannot be sustainable financially without state support? Those are the set of questions that we need to answer before we can talk about what will happen in the future. So let's scale back, bring, put an economist's hat on me and ask the question, how do economists think about education? What is it that they think about? Now, the model I'm going to explain to you is the classic standard model in economics. We teach it in the second semester of every PhD program in economics. It's in a micro sequence, it's a toolbox, it's a standard model which in, in the back of every economist in the world who has gone through standard PhD training in the West and also now in Central Asia and in Japan, but not in Ukraine. Therefore, the model I'm going to tell you might be interesting. Because I'm going to tell you a model in a very simple way, MBA style. So what I'm doing now is MBA style explanations of the model. And I'm going to put a spin on it. I will use this model to interpret the situation in education in Ukraine. And this is something unique. You will not see that in TEDx or MIT courses. Right. So what is the model? I'm not going to tell you immediately. This model pisses people off. It's insulting. It teaches you that there is no value in education. That you come into university dumb and you quit dumb. That's why you don't need to go to the lectures. That's why you don't need to go to the library. Because you're actually not learning anything. Right? That's obviously not true. We don't want to believe that. We, this, you know, we live in the world where we get smarter and smarter and tens of thousands of dollars <coughs> in the US or sometimes it's, so, it's simply thousands of dollars in, in Ukraine are spent for learning and becoming better people. We need to be exposed to Kant and we need to be exposed to Pushkin and we need to be exposed to uh, economic models like the one I'm going <laughs> to teach you right now, <laughs> which we are not getting exposed in Ukrainian system of education. So the model is cynical. It assumes there is no productive effect of education. Education is not about getting better or becoming professional in something. Education is really about exams. Okay, exams are painful. They're not testing anything. They're just painful. Because you know how I passed my exams when I was in Kiev Polytechnic, actually in Kiev School of Economics as well. You study. You pass the exam. You forget. Because you need to study for the next exam. So you have to forget what you have just learned because you don't have operational capacity. Right? So you forget things, you study, you pass the exam, you forget, you study. This is education. 
Now, Coursera doesn't offer that. And you don't need lectures for that because you will say, some people need lectures because it's better for them. They're, they're visual. Maybe, you know, maybe they like the professor. <laughs> they like the style. It's easier for them to learn from the lecture. Some people learn from books. Some people learn from videos. Some people talk to friends. Some people take notes. People learn differently. Bottom line, a year from now, they remember 15% of the material or 10. So why are we spending so much time on learning something we will forget? Now, the story is it comes back to you when you go to the university, but, or excuse me, to the workplace. But do you really use the theorem of Weierstrass in your workplace today? No. Majority of you don't, and those who do probably have learned many other theorems because they work in mass or in applied mass or in something else, right? But do we really need to learn all these mathematical theorems in course of you know, higher mathematics or functional analysis? Do I remember any of the philosophers I suffered through in the Kiev Polytechnic Institute? I, at that point, I remember them all. I don't remember a single one today. Now, the answer to that, this typical answer to that is, no, no, but this, okay, th even if it doesn't come back, it's good for you to be exposed to things. Well, it's good to be exposed to things. It's good to learn kite surfing. Okay? Why are we not uh, learning kite surfing instead of, you know, the answer will be, you are a better person. I doubt that very much, that you're a better person because you learned Nietzsche and didn't spend time doing kite surfing. Now, that might be not a popular opinion. Might be even a sort of rebellion opinion during the Soviet Union times. But today, why should I be learning anything about Nietzsche if I can be kite surfing? Or dancing? Or drinking? Or whatever? So I don't buy the answer that we are learning Nietzsche or Weierstrass theorem for any functional purpose that will be helpful for us in our future workplace, careers, or in social life. We would be better people if we were taught ethics or if we were trained <coughs> in conflict resolution. So we find a way not to argue with our partners in life and we would decrease the number of divorces because people are just nicer to each other. But we're not learning that. That is called professional skills. You will learn them in life. You don't need them. We say education is about something else. It's about reflection. It's time for you to reflect. Well, it's time for you to drink beer and not study and then reflect about a lot of bullshit, and then you come to the exam. So it's really about the exams. I don't see any, anything else. No other function except taking the exams. But that's painful, and what's the point of subjecting people to four years of exams? You know, one thing I remember in my fourth year of bachelor, or fifth or sixth, uh, I still had diploma, I remember it was I do not have to take any more exams in my life, which was not true. Because then I went to the master program in Kiev School of Economics, second time I plugged it in. Um, two years later, I was happy I don't have to <coughs> take any exams because it's painful. Then I go to PhD, two years of coursework, exams, comprehensive exams. Exams are over, then I really know I don't have to take any more exams. Now I can torture people for the rest of my life by writing exams to, for them and have hundreds of students in my classes hating me for the exams. So it's really about exams. But what are the exams? What's special about exams? Yes? What about a better job? Getting an education to get a better job? How? <laughs> Explain the mechanism to me. How better education will get you a better job? Well, well if you have Harvard in your resume... That's different. <laughs> <laughs> that's not better education, that's Harvard. <laughs> I agree that getting Harvard on your CV is helpful <laughs> in getting a better job. But learning Nietzsche in Harvard <laughs> is not necessarily. No one cares what you do in Harvard. <laughs> People might care that you have Harvard and lexicographically, which means second level, yeah? They might care about your grades in Harvard. But no one cares how you got those grades and whether you really remember the material you took in the class. People really care whether your grade in Harvard is 4.0, but they don't care whether you remember anything from that specific course. Because if they did, they would have entry exams at the workplace. Or there would be a system of verification. Harvard would offer a system of verification of remembering something 10 years after. 
No one cares about whether you remember anything or not. People care about having a degree from a prestigious university and having a good, good GPA. Now, so that is correlated with what you know. But it also is correlated with your pure genetic ability to learn things fast and to pass the exams under stress. Okay? And we need to distinguish those two. And what's more important in the workplace? Your ability to learn new things fast and perform under stress or that you know Nietzsche? Okay? So I'm getting at the model and that's not necessarily the true model. I can make a different lecture in which I will say that education is about educating and we need, you know, and so on and so forth. And there is evidence to that. So there is evidence that education actually makes people better, okay? It, it's not just about the exams. But the evidence is focused mostly on the higher school, secondary education. It's primary and second, uh, excuse me, primary education in school up to 12 years. After that, returns on the economy from investing in higher education are slim. It's typically for private gain. For public, for sort of making people better citizens, we invest in schools. This is where we teach people to become not animals. First, you know, five years, and then six years, and after that from six to 16, from seven to, I don't know, 19, depending on the country, we teach people to be civilized. That helps the country, they become better. But not in the universities. The investment in the universities doesn't return, doesn't have the same return on GDP, on economic growth, on the culture. Inve investment in schools does. By the way, Ukraine invests a lot in what? Universities. In universities. In well, I, you know, the lecture is not about the, maybe it is about corruption, but anyway, we should maybe invest in schools if we want to get better education. Now, going back, what is the model about? The model is, is Spence signaling model. Spence is an economist who later became dean of the Stanford Business School, but he got a Nobel Prize for this paper. The paper was written in 1973. What is the idea? The idea is very simple. It is painful to take exams. No one wants to take exams. It's costly. But everyone can pass an exam with grade A. Okay? If that person studies enough. And smarter people can do it faster at a smaller cost. It's not so painful for a smart person to prepare for exam. It's more painful for a dumb person to prepare for exam. Okay, it takes more time, it takes more effort, they have to repeat material more, smarter people catch things faster. That's the model. That is a simple model. Now the idea is simple. You go to a university in order to pass the test. You pass the tests, you have to pass more tests after you pass this first set of tests. You keep passing. There are so many tests and they are so difficult such that we want stupid people to bail out and give up. Okay? They give up finishing the diploma or going to a demanding university like MIT or Harvard. Not because they cannot pass, but just because it will take them forever. It takes more time. It is painful. They, you know, they want to live a life. It's like being in the military because they are not talented enough. And so they choose to go to the workplace earlier. Or they choose to go to a more professional university. Or they choose to go to an easier university. Or they choose to take an easier class. All right? So the idea is that smart people will acquire more education because it is less painful for them to pass the tests. Difficult tests. And not so smart people will acquire not as much education, not in s as good universities, and not uh, at the same level of grades. Not because they can't, but because they are not willing to. They are not willing to put 80 hours a week to get an A. Some people in MIT will get an A after 60 hours. That's uh, how difficult. A genius will get it after 40 hours of study. A normal person would get it after 120 hours, and he or she might not have 120 hours. So we test people out, we push them out. We get people in the educational system so we can screen them. 
we can screen, and based on the degree and based on the grade, we can say who is smarter and who is not. And then the labor market re rewards that. The labor market looks, looks at your degree and says, you're more talented. Now come to us and we will train you. Okay? So the education is not in this model is not about learning anything. It is about separating by studying at a better university and getting better grades. It is about separating from other people who are like you, who look like you, but are not as talented as you are. And your job becomes, since the beginning of the school, to perform in such a way that you pass through all these tests as many as possible and collect it on your CV, extracurricular activity, winning of the Olympiads, this and that, you know, also an athlete, very rounded person, deep, talented, super essay on something. You know, by the time you get to the workplace, out of the six billion people who enter, okay, one or, you know, 500 million people entering into the workplace, you have to have a CV which beats them all to get a better job. Otherwise, you are picking rice in China. And this is not a good outcome. Or you are working in a mine in Ukraine. All right, it's a competitive world. No one owes anyone anything. You have to prove to the world in the first 15, 20 years of your life that you are better than others. And you do it by passing exams, as difficult exams as possible, in as prestigious universities as possible, as good grades as possible, as many different directions as possible. Then you have your CV, and all this CV does to you, it gets you an interview. All right? It gets you an interview. You fuck up that interview, 20 years don't matter. All right? So the education serves one single purpose, to get the first set of interviews in the workplace, in the labor market. Once you've got that, you are on your own. This is where your old soft skills, which you hopefully acquired on the side, how to be smooth, how to be likable, how to be uh, empathic, how to connect with people, which we don't train and don't test for in the educational system, right? So all those skills are suddenly become important at the first interview, or at the first set of interviews. So you don't only have to si set up a CV in your 15, 20 years. You also have to somehow acquire all the soft skills, what they call <coughs> emotional intelligence, right? Which we don't teach you, because we don't know what it is. We don't know how to be likable. Everyone wants to be likable. Maybe you have to take art classes, performance classes, public speaking classes, who knows? Many people acquire that intuitively while they're trying to get through the hoops. But basically these are two functions. You need to reach two objectives. You need to get the best interview and you need to get <coughs> soft skills to pass that interview. All right, this is what the education is about in this model. I enriched it a little bit with the soft skills. Now. You might not like that perspective. I didn't like it in the beginning. It took me 10, 20 years to start believing it a little bit more. Yes, we do teach people. So the reality is we're not only testing people, we're also teaching them something. And by being exposed to better teachers and better universities, you'll get better education. This is all true. But really, I have learned so much after graduating from my last university or degree that it is incomparable, incomparable relative to what I learned in classes. Okay? So it really, getting a PhD diploma in Wisconsin is good, but I should have gotten it in Yale. Okay? Being the very same person, being the very same person. I was honest when I applied for PhD. I had bad grades from Kiev Polytechnic Institute. And uh, my friend, who was at that point a secretary, of the department offered to manufacture the transcripts that I would have a better uh, GPA. And I said, no, I'm going to live the life honestly. Okay? I want to be a hero. All right? So I submitted the GPA, which was not very good. And I only got into Wisconsin with financial support, into University of Penn. Pennsylvania without financial support, and to UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, without financial support. Now, University of Pennsylvania offered me first year without support, and future years potentially with support. 
I didn't have twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, so I didn't want to get them, you know, by selling the apartment or something like that in Kiev in Ukraine. So I went to Wisconsin and I should have gone to Penn. I should have done gone to Penn because you get into a different tier. This world is not fair. You get selected and they treat you differently. The market treats you differently. And then to overcome this handicap, when you graduate from Wisconsin, not from Yale, you need to work for 10, 20 years to catch up with those people. And you don't catch up with people like you who are working full speed. You only catch up with lazy guys who graduated from a slightly better university than yours. Okay? So they have to work less to stay at the same level of performance. Okay? So now, if we accept this model as a thought exercise, let's think about the future of education. Okay? You see, technology doesn't really matter. It's not about technology. It's about the reputation of a university that it does two things. It is demanding at the entry level, so it selects better students, right? So you get in a smarter pool of kids. If you graduate from Harvard or MIT, that means other things equal, you are smarter than a person who is graduating from Wisconsin. And second, the university itself has to maintain its reputation of testing people. We know that you cannot bribe your way through in Wisconsin, in Harvard, or in Pittsburgh, or can you? Sometimes you can. If your parents are donors, you might get a special treatment. If you are an athlete who is successful, the university might want to have you in order to attract more students who will be watching a great play. So you, there are ways to cut corners in the US system, in the European system, in other systems. There are always ways to cut corners. But overall, for majority of us, the options to cut corners are limited. And so for the university, it is important to maintain the reputation. Okay. So if this is our perspective, what's the future? The future is, in my opinion, that all the universities which have not yet established a reputation, and they're really in the business of producing diplomas today, but not selecting better people, they'll be out of business. Coursera, Prometheus, and others will kick them out. With today, we can bring a great teacher from the US. He will train five great teachers here. Two years from now, we are running a project management ad hoc standing course, which is much better than anything there is in universities here. We see that happening already in Ukraine. We see that happening in the US as well. Entry to teach something has become very simple. You don't need a big university with classrooms in order to bring professors who will teach you project management. You can do it on the site. You just need to bring a big name you professor. So the future will be for some professors, for some people, individuals, their reputation will become even more important. Popular professors will become superstars. The top universities, top 10, 20, 30, 50 universities, which provide the service of guaranteeing to the market that it is a good diploma, that people are smart and they have been selected, like Harvard or like Keith Mahila Academy here. I see you, unfortunately, doesn't exist anymore, but potentially. Then uh, maybe Shevchenko here, some departments. Kiev School of Economics, I'm plugging it for the third time. I have to plug it five times, you know, that's <laughs> the conditions of the one. Uh, and I plug in uh, ICU three times, that's the thing. Uh, I've done twice, I'm counting. No, it's a joke, there are no conditions like that. Uh, but you can count them with business school, for instance, or Ukumo generally, some other entry. And you see this a new entrance. If they can establish a long-term reputation that they are good, they will survive. Everyone else will die. <coughs> Our three, four, five hundred of educational institutions which are sucking in budget taxpayers' money, they'll be out of business as long, you know, immediately after there'll be a minister in the system of education and a coalition in the parliament, which is not connected to rectors. Okay? That part of the future of education in Ukraine is clear. Right? All these guys are basically, and it's on record, all these guys are basically unemployed. 
out of 300 or 400 u universities in Ukraine, good two thirds of them will not exist 20 years from now. They have nothing to offer. They cannot screen and that's their problem because you can bribe your way or the, you know, the quality of the exams of testing is very low. So they have nothing to offer in the 21st century. The only thing which matters in the 21st century is the guarantee that once you get as a firm, a student from this university with this diploma, you're getting a smart kid who can perform under pressure. You don't care about anything else. And so I don't see how a random university in Ukraine, for instance, in Poltava, I've learned today, <coughs> nothing personal. And it's not my field, so I am not too threatened. There is a university of uh, Sadivnitstva, which has 700 students. I'm not sure it will survive 20 years from now. Okay? Although it can. If it, it introduces new technologies, robotic planting, you know, have you seen these pictures or videos where, you know, the robot runs around and like drops one, one little drop of water. So if they teach that, I think it's an Uman or somewhere. In Paltau, I don't know. Anyway, if they teach that, and there's demand for that, but you know, will there be demand for that if uh, we don't have a market for land? That's a plug. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. I hear that every year that there will be a market for land starting from this year. <laughs> <laughs> and then the agri-holdings say, no, no, we don't need that because we figured out a way to run everything through land rent, right? So they're not interested <coughs> in competition. Anyway, so these universities are also not interested in competition, so they will control the budget so that it becomes difficult for other universities to enter. And we know that as long as there is a diluted value of diplomas in Ukraine, the public does not understand, in particular parents don't, don't understand why they should pay 10 or 20 thousand dollars for a student to study in some new university like UKU. Or Kiev School of Government, way, way cheaper. But <laughs> um, and better. Uh, it's, like, it's like marketing. We are better, cheaper, we are more fun, and unlike in this model, we actually teach you things, okay? Uh, but, so that, that I think that is clear. The universities will die, as we know them. Uh, not because they are not needed, but because the rectors are stupid, okay? Uh, and because they do not adjust. All right. But really, what will happen in the US? And nothing will happen in the US. The top 50 universities will continue to raise their tuition and will continue to attract students from all over the world, in particular from China and from other emerging markets, to teach them and to send them back to their countries with the top degrees. So your job, if you're thinking about education, or education of your friends, children, or parents. You might want to educate your parents. Send them to the best possible university you can get. Ranking is the only thing which matters. Don't go to a university which is nice, which is a good fit for you, has a nice degree or something. This all is irrelevant 10, 15, 20 years. The only thing which matters is the degree, is the name, Harvard. MIT or something else, or Wisconsin in my case, which sits on your... No one cares where you will work. People will care eventually about what? Your degree and your CV. What you have done after the education. So, will Prometheus or Coursera take over the universities? I don't believe that. Will some universities, universities take over Prometheus or Coursera? That might be possible. It is a more likely outcome that UKU or Kiev School of Economics or ICU, if it gets resurrected, will absorb and acquire something like Prometheus or will get an extension license from Coursera to run blend courses in Ukraine. Because it is the brand name which matters, not the actual course. And Coursera and Prometheus do not have any technology which will guarantee that the exams are passed honestly. And universities do. UKU has a technology. They have faculty who know how to write exams. They have 
a system which sets up people to put them in the room and something like that. Now, you have all these testing services like uh, TOEFL, right? You have these GRE companies. They perhaps are good at testing. Why don't they take over Prometheus or Coursera? Well, because they don't know what good education is, what good testing is. They can test mechanically. So they, things can be outsourced to them. If I can imagine a world campus at the University of Pennsylvania testing tons of thousands, tens of thousands of people from another country, I could totally imagine hiring the same company which does testing for TOEFL. But we will be in charge of what we write on the exams. The faculty, which understands what is relevant today, will be in charge. So the real value of education or the, the real comparative advantage of the universities or whoever does that, it is the professors who know how to write the exam. If the entire model is about testing and the tests later teach the entire world how to prepare to the tests, right? Because once you know what's on the tests, it guides your learning. People who will be writing the tests, people who have the capacity and the ability to write the tests, are the people who will determine the future of education in the world and in the country. Okay? So if I were to be looking into the future and the comparative advantages or competitiveness of the universities, I would be looking into faculty. The best faculty it is there is in Ukraine. So I, we are still in the best faculty. I am constantly looking. We are hiring secretly and sometimes not very secretly. We are collecting faculty because it is future. Faculty is future. Technology will adjust. All right. So now for you specifically. Let's talk about the demand side. Okay. Let's talk about the demand side. I, I have talked about the supply side. Right. So my model of the future of education is that the faculty, the critical faculty will become important. But Something, something doesn't add up with this model. I, but how could faculty be important if we're teaching mathematics? Mathematics has a set of questions which have been out there for 20 years or 200 years or 2,000 years, and there is no need to write new questions, right? So why do we need new special faculty? Actually, first yes and no, because the specific faculty, if you write the same questions over and over, people will adjust, right? If it's about testing, they will learn and with the new technology of cheating that soon we'll have technology which is implanted in our brain and you can't scan it you know whether it's on and off you know give it 20 30 years you'll get answers from your friends in the so you really need to come up with new questions so people who can write new questions in the environment with hundreds of years of existing questions is the guys who will be very demanded okay so writing good tests will be important but even more importantly, there'll be new fields arriving all the time, like bioengineering, bioengineering, or you know, uh, legal representation of robotics. You know, people are saying in economics or somewhere there is something that in the future there'll be an issue of ethics of robots, and someone will have to represent robots in courts or in some disputations in the mechanism, and so that will be a profession that you will have to defend legal rights of our AI systems. Have you seen a video by Boston Robotics where they built a kind of horse-like walking robot uh, and they are harassing it really. They're kicking it, they're trying to, s have you seen it? They're punching it. Yes. Now I squirmed, I, I didn't enjoy, you know, like I know it's a machine but I didn't enjoy, I, you know, I wanted to protect the robot because I, f I felt bad for, for the robot. The robot was being kicked by the, and it's like, you know, it's almost like it's like a prisoner, you know, the robot has to go there and they're kicking it and throwing and pushing it with, you know, sticks and stuff and the robot doesn't, doesn't resist. It's like gets up completely at subdued and keeps walking there. I'm not sure I want that robot, by the way. Because it, it doesn't have any percent, it doesn't, you know, I want that robot to turn back and say, but the moment I get that feel, I worry about the future of the humankind, okay? <laughs> so there will be professions which, which will have to figure this out. Because humans will have taste and preferences, not only over the functionality of robots, but over the functions which will imitate emotions. And we'll probably have some laws which will protect robots from abuse by humans. We have laws which protect animals from abuse, right? Why do we care about animals? Animals are not humans. 
Well, what does it mean, you know, life, you know? You, we're gonna get in this definition of life, and why is it that we want to protect which is, uh, everything which is alive? Do we want to protect snakes? Or cockroaches in my kitchen? There are no laws which protect my cockroaches, which I kill if I catch them, right? Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and we know kids, they like to take, uh, you know, flies apart, right? There are no laws which are protecting flies. <laughs> so, you know, life is not a good definition. We protect cats. They're cute. <laughs> we protect dogs. They're committed. They're friendly. They love us unconditionally. So they're slaves, but in a um, sort of nice way, right? So we protect them. So we want robots to be like dogs. Unconditional love, but personality. Some emotions. And that's a slippery slope, right? Anyway, there'll be professions like that. Someone will have to write exams for these guys. Okay? And as the things will be developing faster and faster, you will need people who will be able to prepare new courses very quickly. It will be like target. Like today there is a you know, DNA targeting treatment. Today we have a lot of uh, food which can be targeted specifically to you. If you go to a good restaurant, the menus become huge. And in principle, you can suggest things. You, you, you can ask them to do certain things, and they will do. They, the things become flexible. They are targeted. Consumers today like control over the environment. We want the world to submit to us. We want chairs which adjust. We want cars which provide us with uh, controlled climate around us so we're willing to pay fifty thousand dollars to drive around to you know not not to get in a car or in a bike but to basically drag around us a very fancy chair and a climate control right because you alternatively can ride a bus no but we prefer to ride in a car which might cost 50k <laughs> so we like to control environment and so will be happening in education we would want courses which are targeted individually to us and there will be uniquely targeted courses. We see some of that anyway, historically. You know, private education, one-on-one -on -one teaching. But we'll, the technology will allow us to scale that up. We'll have Uber or Mechanical Turk, which will basically have professors who are good at something and professors who are good at something else. And there'll be demand coming in for a certain course from a different country or from a different group of people. And if people are willing to do that and pay the bill, those two professors, so three or five, <coughs> will get together, will see what's available already, will design a new course, a new combination, and you'll be trained by the, uh, based on that course, and you will be tested based on that. So the education will become targeted. But the model, the technology, I expect it to be the same. It will basically be some curricula, topics which you need to know, and testing afterwards. It's just that the topics could be different, and you might listen to lectures, you might listen to... Audio, you can read books, you can watch videos, there'll be all kinds of uh, channels to deliver information to you. So, education will be a curriculum and a channel to deliver information to you in the most efficient way, and then a testing technology which uh, tests your understanding of this information. So, that will become targeted. At least I think so. And universities will survive as a clusters of this targeted. People, people who are good at writing, you know, at developing new courses and testing. Maybe not in Ukraine, okay? Because if these guys continue to do, we'll basically, I think, uh, we'll outsource all our education to other countries uh, if they don't reform the system of education here soon enough. And they're not going to reform it because, you know, the pace of reform, you see what they're doing. They're discussing whether we should have English or not in a degree, right? They're discussing whether we should have, you know, should have so many hours or so few, whether the stipend should be 800 hryvnias to everyone or 1,600 uh, hryvnias to half of people. This is a joke, right? It's, it's not a reform. The world is walking away at a faster rate. You're not going to attract uh, faculty, quality faculty, which can teach good courses and design new courses tailored to the needs of Ukraine by discussing for years whether the stipend should be 800 hryvnias or 1600 hryvnias. You have to do something drastically different. Now, no one in the among politicians today have the guts to truly change the system, so I don't expect that happening. Plus, there are a lot of vested interests. So, future of education in Ukraine looks 
מיקסט. Now people criticize me for saying that uh, I just, you know, basically constantly, you know, blame the Ukrainian education for not being good enough, that we still have good people. But I'm not complaining about people. I'm not complaining about university, excuse me, faculty, professors. I'm not saying we don't have good professors. I, when I'm talking about education, I'm talking about the system. I'm talking about how universities use these professors. That's a waste of resource. And so when I say there's no future for the system of education, I'm not saying there's no future for smart professors. There's a lot of future. All of these guys will set up their own companies and will train their own kids. And future is bright for them. We need to help them. We need to build bridges for them to move into the future. But the universities as they are now, they're dead. Because diploma doesn't carry this value of reputation in it. Right? With the exception of the very few, maybe first hundred of universities in Ukraine. The last 300 don't have any, you know, you probably haven't heard of the majority of them, right? Can you name, how many universities can you name? Just like. So someone, <laughs> someone, you know, it's a, like style of Kaha Bindukidze, but it was not Kaha Bindukidze. But it's a style of Kaha Bindukidze. How to do reform in uh, university education. You come to the desk. And you get a, you know, five people. And you write down the names of the universities you remember. And you shut down everything else. <laughs> right? What you don't remember, what 10 people don't remember, you know, you probably have to have representatives from different, you know, cities and stuff. But basically you get people, you know, probably I don't remember universities from Chernovsi and Odessa, but we can get someone from Odessa, you know, a couple of people. And we do this exercise. And people who don't remember university, you know, if, the uni if no one remembers from, let's say, it's like constitutional convent. You get a representative from each region, you elect them, you know, and then name, they name three universities. And you get this snowball kind of algorithm. You name people, people name universities, you're done with that, you shut down everything else. Now, there'll be resistance to that. But this, you know, this is hypothetical. OK, so now <coughs> I would like to talk <coughs> a little bit <coughs> for the remaining 10, 15 minutes about two things. First, if you are thinking of education yourself, what you should do. And if you are not thinking mm -hmm. about education, why you should be thinking about education. Let me start with the first, with the second one. Why everyone should be investing in education? Well, because whatever skills we have today will not be relevant tomorrow. What are the skills that I have? You know, I'm a game theorist, so I know game theory. I know Nash equilibrium, I understand the auction theory, I understand the contract theory. But I don't understand coding, I don't understand big data, I don't understand empirics. My field will be dead in five, ten years. So I need to learn and adjust. OK, I can teach well. But with the technology coming, with the access to better teachers, I'm becoming stressed. My skills could be useful, but I need to adjust them and start giving lectures about something interesting. Clearly, no one cares about my lecture about Nash equilibrium. 10 years from now. Maybe Nash equilibrium will be the paradigm of the past. It's like no one cares about uh, Marxism Leninism now. <laughs> well, okay, maybe I'm uh, too optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the environment where I am, no one cares about Marxism Leninism. Okay, and people who were excellent teachers of Marxism Leninism? They exactly. Are they are probably now excellent teachers of what? Of what? Religion. <laughs> <laughs> That's called adjustment. <laughs> right? You have to figure out what you are good at and move to a different areas. But even better, you want to acquire some skills which you haven't had before. And so what are those skills? Basically, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is known. There's nothing new. 
So the skills, there is always someone who is better than you in any skill you take. Anything I do. There are people who are much better than me, and there are thousands of them. And even in my local market in Ukraine, there are better teachers than me, there are better game theorists than me, there are better economists than, than me, there are better admins than me, there are better PR people than me. A, every function I do today, I might be the best really in Ukraine in the game theory because no one you know, is trained in game theory as well. But that's because no one needs game theory in Ukraine. <laughs> All right? I might be in the best in the irrelevant skill. Because if there were demand for game theories, there would be people who are better than me in all likelihood. So, but how can I manage the Kiev School of Economics without being the best in finance, in PR, in marketing, in admin, in education, in academics, in anything? It is the combination of skills which is unusual. Now I'm giving you a different economics model. What is the value of labor today? It's not an individual skill. It's an unusual package of different skills. So in order to be competitive, you have to have a set of skills which is relevant to the market. And others people don't have. So what, who I'm looking today for in, in my, let's say, marketing department or in business development department? We need a person who can do simultaneously fundraising and marketing, or understand that. A person who understands commercial marketing and sales, and a person who understands provision by a public good by an NGO. A person who is committed to the cause of maybe Ukraine, and a person who is cynical who can do financial planning. We don't need a person who is the best in any of this. We don't need a person who is a super marketing, you know, or super sales. We need a person who understands all of this a little bit, so that person will have a big picture and we'll be able to comprehend that big picture. And then we will hire for each of the sub-pictures an individual who is professional. But we will pay him five times less than to this person who is not good at anything but has a, a, a big picture in mind. So it is a combination of skills today which is very rewarded by the labor markets. And so that's why education is important. Not because you want to learn something well, but because you want to acquire skills which are different. Why do I take dance classes? in private, from world champions, because they teach you connection. They teach you how to connect with a partner. They don't teach you moves, they teach you how to connect at the top level. Why do I need to know how to connect with people? Because when I'm on TV, I have some understanding of how to connect with the other people who are present in the room and with the audience. I'm not very good at that, but I'm using skills from dancing to be able to connect with the audience which I don't see. Because in dancing, you, when you perform, you need a move, you don't remember, you still have to be connected. <laughs> you have to have a sense, awareness of the environment around you. I use it that, wh why do I need that? Because I want to be on TV, why do I need to be on TV? Because we need to attract students to the school. More publicity attracts students. We attract students, better students, we attract better faculty. We have better faculty and better students, we have donors. We have donors, we have better faculty and better students. So all skills are complementary to each other. So you need to invest in your own education, not to become better at something else. You, it might be very difficult. You don't have another 10, 20 years to be an expert. But you have to acquire a set of skills which other people don't have. So you can take advantage of new opportunities which are opening today with the new technology arising. All right, that's why you should invest in education, in your own education. How to do it? Definitely not by taking Coursera courses. All right? You have to get yourself out of the comfort, comfort zone. Coursera doesn't get you out of the... It does the opposite. It brings you into the comfort zone. You can watch it when you have time. Right? No, you have to be stressed. Exams is one way of being stressed. Now, I am talking about a slightly different take on education. Education is helpful. Exams are helpful not because they test you, but because they stress you. They get you out of your com comfort zone and you become, you become like a child again. Things are new. You don't understand what's happening. And once you don't understand what's happening, you start interpreting inf information afresh. Because when you understand what's happening, you mislead yourself. You think you understand what's happening, but it's your mind which is trying to control the environment. You get new information, but you think it's not new information. You have an expectation. It's like intellectual arrogance. We're in Ukraine, all are intellectual arrogance. 
arrogant. We know answer to everything. Why economy is, is not growing? Corruption. <laughs> Why corruption is not being combined? Bad politicians. <laughs> Why politicians are bad? Well, because good people don't get there. All these explanations are bullshit. And if we reflect on any of them, we know that the worst thing which can happen, even worse than what we have today, is the same incompetent government, the same absence of political uh, parties with no corruption. Because then the economy will shut down. Because today at least you can get something done because you... <laughs> you know how to contact. It's the response of the market <coughs> to inefficiency by creating informal economy. Now we call it corruption. We don't like informal economy, of course. <laughs> we would like to be in a formal economy. But our formal economy is incapable of delivering even basic functions, right? Tomorrow you will get in a hospital with some probability. Do you really want the doctor to be afraid to take a bribe in today's conditions? If they don't have drugs to treat you today, or most of them are incompetent, or the laws don't allow you to move from this clinic to another clinic where there is a competent doctor in your specific condition. This is stupid not to pay a bribe to move, right? You can say they have to do it for free. Well, they have to do it for free. But someone has to pay the cost of moving you to a different hospital. And of course it has to be done by a helicopter for free. But uh, it's written in the law, but there are no helicopters left in Ukraine, which will transport you, okay? I had this situation with my mom. She was in a hospital in Poltava and, uh, you know, they had to, it was critical and they had to transfer her to, uh, to Kyiv and they would refuse to transfer to Kyiv without bribe because you know what it means you know they admit their incompetence and then there's helicopters which are supposed to come and transfer her but there are no helicopters in the law there are helicopters and so they don't they don't sign a piece of paperwork because the, the law doesn't allow they have to only transfer her by helicopter that's what the law says and if she dies someone will go to prison or potentially can be a, you know, go to prison. So you have to do something, you know. And so, you know, corruption is the way to pay people for the risk they are taking by breaking the law. A doctor who will sign off my mom to be moved to a different hospital can go to prison if she dies on the way. Well, he or she will not go to prison. She will be harassed by police, right? So she needs to have money to pay to the police in case they come. So that's what you're paying for, okay? Now let's shut this down, completely corruption, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that if you don't think, you come up with bullshit arguments, all right? And you need to keep thinking, and that's why you need education. And in order to keep thinking, you have to be stressed. Because if you're not stressed, you accept low quality arguments. And that's why you need testing, that's why you need education. You need to go to places which will stress you. Even better if these places then later can give you a diploma which have a reputation of value. Okay, even better. But at least you have to go to places which will stress you. And everyone has to go there because we will be out of jobs if we don't continuously improve today. Because the world is changing continuously. The times where we can acquire one profession and this profession is good enough for 25 or 35 years of our life is over. Professions today in the car, you know, even programmers, they have to learn new languages frequently enough. What, you know, some professions, the, the type of skills which are needed are changing, you know, seasonally. So the points I try to make are two on the supply side and two on the demand side. On the supply side, I think education is about faculty which can set up new courses and can test properly. The universities will survive if they can take advantage of that faculty. And the job for the universities is to do everything they can to attract the best faculty. Everything else doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Quality of faculty matters. This is on the supply side. Universities will pro provide basically a brand name saying we have enough good faculty. On the demand side, I want to make two points. One point is you have to study because the competitive world is out there. The machines will get us out of jobs. How do you study? Put yourself in a stress situation. Be stressed. There are multiple ways of doing it. But 
casual browsing through videos on internet is not the way to go. All right, I will stop here. Yes. Isn't getting stressed in the actual job more productive than in the classroom? Yes, for what you do at the job. So you'll go in terms of depth. In order to move to the other level, you have to grow your breath. You have to learn skills which will be rewarded later, not immediately. Of course, you might be in a position where you can grow your skills organically. That's the best outcome. Learning on the job, you might, you know, is the best. You might be in the environment where the, the company trains you, moves you around, rotates you, gives you opportunities to try different things, grows you. There is a word in, in the US. We are going to hire this person, but who will grow her? We don't have capacity to grow her. You might be working in the environment where people are grown by their superiors. Then you don't need education. But not everyone is lucky, right? Not every company in Ukraine today grows its own people. Then you have to grow yourself by putting yourself in, uncomfor in uncomfortable situations. Of course, I'm not saying that you cannot learn or can grow without always being stressed. Some people are good at this. Some people don't, you know, they, they're like, once you get inspired, excited, you have intrinsic motivation. That's the best you can do. You don't need, you don't need to break yourself. It is when you feel that you are in the environment where, you, where your growth has plateaued. This is when you need to break yourself out of this. That's why I say you, if you feel that you are plateaued, you have to go somewhere where you are taken out of the zone of comfort by people who are extremely smart. <coughs> and once they break you, or break your sort of surface, they'll expose you to ideas which you have, or angles, perspectives which you have not been exposed to. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot grow <coughs> organically. Yes? You said that uh, you should uh, close uh, uh, that university and uh, have uh, uh, some head uh, Ina Sassoon that worked uh, in the <coughs> Ministry of Education and uh, she had changed to close this university. What, what do you think about it? And, uh, okay. okay, so first of all, did she really have a chance? So we're talking about Ina Sassoon. Who is currently uh, a VP for public administration in Kiev School of Economics? And we want her to set up the best program for public administration, master for public administration in Ukraine. And I want other universities to be scared. Okay? <laughs> we will take your students. Softly. But we will take your students. Okay. Are she capable of setting up MPA? Yes, with help of the brand name, yes. Our brand name gives an opportunity to other faculty to believe that we will provide a good program. We've been here for 20 years. We survived a bunch of crises, global in Ukraine, countrywide, and individuals. So we can do that. Now, did she have a chance to shut down the universities? I doubt that very much. Politics is not a machine where you can press a button and get things done. There's so many ways to sabotage anything from getting done, and w as we have observed in the last two and a half years. Okay. Does she have a view which is aligned with me, that she believes that most universities have to be shut down? Absolutely not. I don't think, actually I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised <coughs> if she believes that these universities have to be saved and improved from the top. I don't believe any of this. Now, does it mean that we're not interested in Inna Safsun and the Kiev School of Economics? Quite the opposite. We're interested in the diversity of the opinions. We want strong people and we, we want them to represent different views. So if you take a lecture from her, she can tell you a very different take on the future of education in Ukraine and worldwide. And that's the beauty of it, that you get exposed to different opinions. So this is my response to, it's not absolute truth what I say, it might be complete bullshit, it's just my perspective. Other questions please? Yes, go ahead. In your talk, you didn't touch an important issue of an interrelation between education, especially higher education, science, or research. That's so right. One of my ma major 
function of the higher education is to pursue scientific research, and for that you need to find good students. That is correct. A lot, a lot of professors are teaching only for one reason, to find a good student who will pursue his school or her school. Person. That's more so here in Ukraine. In the US I teach if I get a good student, that's great. I don't expect necessarily. I would move to a university where there would be better students. That is correct. That is attractive because uh, some of them will work. But um, the American system, where the one I'm exposed to, does, doesn't have the schools. So it's not like here, but we have, you know, you have an academic or, you know, uh, academic, not uh, an academic professor, but academician. Yeah, you have a highly profiled uh, professor and he has a, a lot of followers. Yeah. It's not like that. There are cliques, there are clubs, but they are more horizontal. <coughs> and the system is set up that you basically, once you have a good student, you cannot keep that get good student after he graduates with you. So the person who got a PhD has to live. Yeah, I know that. He must live, actually. He so must he live. Ha he has to find postdoc in another... Somewhere, yeah. Place. Later, maybe, come back. But yes, it is important part. And uh, out of the new universities, I think uh, this is my last plug, I hope, for the Kiev School of Economics. We do have PhDs. That's the core of the faculty. People who have PhDs, we have several tracks. Some are teacher professors. Some are executive professors. This is for MBA. Some are policy professors. So those are people who teach and also do policy, like grants and consulting. And we also have people who are research professors. They teach and just do research. Their job is to write academic articles. And they're at the PhD level in economics. So I don't think there are any other department in Ukraine which has that approach or that type of faculty in economics. In other departments, there are definitely much stronger departments in STEM, you know, in engineering, math, and so on and so forth. We do have very strong people. We have to support them in some ways. Oh, and we're losing a lot of them. And we're losing students. It's uh, the brain drain is happening at the bachelor level. Uh, people are going actually to Moscow, to Moscow State still, or to high school of economics at the bachelor level. So we're losing the best. Um, sometimes we lose them directly to the U.S. or Europe, and sometimes we lose them to Russia. This must stop. But of course, we don't see. When we are talking about reform of education, that's what you should be talking about. You know, I want to see real serious discussion, not about some kind of what is fair or which stipends and how we should think. I want to see specific discussion about how we stop brain drain to Russia. Okay, we might not be able to stop brain drain to the U.S. and might be in our interest to have some of these people go there and 10% or 5% of them to come back. That might be better. But we definitely are capable of stop stopping the brain drain to Russia. I don't see that discussion. Yeah. Yes, please. G yeah, go ahead. Uh, you said about better students, best students. How do you see is it this person best, better students, or? What? How do we see if a student is good? How do you personally see? Uh, what do, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? Wh what does it mean for me? It's hard to say, but that's a person who performs. I don't care how he gets to the exams or to writing papers or to whatever his task is, but this is a person who delivers on time and delivers high quality. That's typically is obvious. Well, it doesn't matter if that person is smart but doesn't deliver. That person doesn't deliver, he's not going to do well in life. Okay, uh, then another question. Okay. There are people who are introverted and extroverted. Extroverted, they t uh, tend to talk more, um, they are, sorry, more noisy, they get more attention. While uh, introverted, they can be more, you know, quietly doing their job and not talking about this job. So, but the way it is in our university and in the universities I have taught, the exams are in writing. And they're graded by, you but know, I it doesn't... I'm talking about exams only. I'm talking also about a uh, job place mm -hmm. where you... Okay, so you're correct. So, so no, no, but you, you asked about students, see, okay? But let, let me, you asked about students. So, you know, there are multiple ways to uh, try to even out the playing field. Definitely it matters what people think, not how they deliver it. But it's also important that in the end of the day, they learn to deliver it in multiple ways. So typically the ways which can compensate for the inability of a person to present herself well or himself well 
is reference letters. So in, in our school, we place people. We, we talk to our potential employers and we say this student is good, even if that student is not very talkative. So in that way, we try to compensate for an ability of the person to shine at the interview. And then people can take different tracks. Um, you know, some people will be more publicly visible, some people will be moving the science or the field or coming up <coughs> with new algorithm, fundamental, uh, changing something, and without ever saying a word. So the interview is not necessarily oral. The interview, what I mean by interview, is your contact with the employer. And the contact with an employer, if it's a good employer, will take multiple layers. Of course, there will be an oral discussion, but there will be letters of references <coughs> if it's a good, uh, or they will do a homework by calling us and asking. And there will be also probably some tests too, right? So an interview is something broader than just a conversation. Although, unfortunately, conversations continues to be extremely important. <coughs> or fortunately, so, but that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you have, you, have uh, you said uh, that your Kuku C uh, push out your bad university. I see and you. Uh, I see you, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and <coughs> one question. Uh, do you need some uh, support of uh, government? And, uh, Never hurts. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean uh, under what conditions? <laughs> is it an uh, idea to close bad university? And, and give their money to us, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it can uh, broke uh, competition, you said that competition is... Well, you know, when I'm pushing my school, I don't care about competition. I only care about competition when it is other schools, <laughs> <laughs> right? I already know that my school is the best. That everything else should be shut down and all the money should be given to us. <laughs> There's no need to prove. But when it comes to some other universities performing well, we have to fight <laughs> them <laughs> and they have to compete against us. So, you know, there are two perspectives. From the perspective of the society, you want to advocate competition. From this perspective of the university, your job is to try to capture the market as much as possible, mm -hmm. to become a monopolist. Hopefully other universities will try to do the same. In this way, we all in the fight and the competition will become, will become better. We do compete for students. This year we took 67 students in our two graduate programs in master and something like 45 in MBA. Clearly we compete with some universities. Right? And we find ways to be more appealing. And in this way, we become better. And competition is good. Now, if we are sitting on state support and we don't care very much, we actually pay students and they don't pay to us. That's a little bit, you know, different life. So, but I agree with you. Money from bad universities should be given <laughs> to good universities. Who is good? We are. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you gave uh, 20, 20 plays for uh, regions yeah, uh, for people from Yeah, we gave 20 uh, in Kiev School of Economics, we gave 20 stipends and, yeah, and uh, tuition uh, waivers for people from regions. What is the aim of this? What is, uh, is to is even out unfairness that people who have grown up I not in Kiev or in big towns have had fewer opportunities to acquire skills and are not as exposed to the good universities. So we want to handicap for that. I, I know, but uh, you see, it's business. It's not like a social... We are non-profit. The corporation is non-profit. We're not business. Oh, yeah. We have business uh, legal entities. Where KEC is actually five legal entities. But the parent company is a US non-profit registered in Washington, D.C. We, uh, our objective is not to generate profit. Our objective is to produce generations of economists and managers and business people who will be competent and who hopefully will make a difference in the generations to come. So this is our objective. It's much more noble objective <coughs> than earning money, although earning money is important because if people were not earning money, no one would be supporting us. So everyone does what they think uh, you know, they're better at. We're not good at earning money, but we are good at producing economies. Other questions? Uh, yes. I have a private question. That's a good venue for a private question. No. 
There is a treasurer who is sitting in the Eurasian Foundation, and there is a bunch of people on the board who are in the U.S., but we do not have an office, physical office there. But we are registered, we submit reports, we're being audited by the, and so on and so forth. We are a legal entity in the U.S., but we do not have an office in the U.S. I'm going to the U.S. to study. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to study here in Kiev. Uh, I used to study management and business administration. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any um, uh, requests regarding um, skills that I should prefer in the U.S.A.? Because apart from studying here from the Ukraine, as you know, mm -hmm. do you have any comparisons that I might cope for myself? I think I, I, you know, I went to uh, an American boarding school here, uh, also from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I had studied in America before, but I hadn't been to the university in higher education. First of all, let me. So you'll be all right. Anyway, the U.S. system. You know, everyone gets through. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people got through American educational system. Everyone survived. Um, Everyone got a career after that. The, que the real question is, um, if um, have you fixed the university to which you're going? No, I haven't. Okay, so you have to try to get into the best you can, the, be the highest ranked university. That's the only objective. It doesn't matter how you get there. You have to get there. How you get it, you, you get there by having a great CV and getting great le uh, letters of reference. So you, you need someone to write, you know, you need someone to vouch for you. You get in there, you figure it out. You don't like it there, you move to another university. It's not a big deal. Their m mobility is easy. You don't like the topic, you, you change department. All of that it doesn't, doesn't really matter. You're uncomfortable with something, you'll move around. Just keep your eyes open. But entry point is the most important thing. Get to the highest entry point. Well, I'm asking this because they uh, have said that uh, universities from the far west are much more different than yeah, they all are different, but you know, each of them is so much different, so much more different from us here, than their relative differences are not so important. And even if you suffer in Midwest for five years or two years or one year, afterwards you will be able to move anywhere you want. So, you know, a better place, better ranked place will give you more opportunities to move later in your life. This is not the time to choose the location. Or they play. They are different, but who cares? Okay, I'm happy to talk about it in more detail afterwards. Your question, please. Yes, but like for me, the, um, the biggest problem of our university is the administration and the management of the university. Maybe it, um, for me, no, the corruption is not the biggest pro problem. Uh, the problem is the quality of education, quality of material, material of schedule. Uh, Curriculums and the other. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how uh, the administration and the man the management of our universities uh, must be changed? But you see, okay. So I'll answer the question: Is how the you know the issue with curricula and so on is the administration and uh, how we should work with the administration? How could they change? This is true, but the way I think about it is that this is a consequence of the faculty. In in the end, who defends the integrity and the quality? It's people who teach or do research. You put bad teachers or bad faculty in, administrators will not save them. Now, you, you can have bad administrators, but great faculty, other faculty will come. The faculty comes not because of the administrators, but because of other faculty, or, and, or because of the students. Mm -hmm. In other words, who protects at a university? the quality of education. Who invests in increasing quality? Faculty. Not administrators. If administrators misbehave, faculty will be displaced. In a reasonably working environment, which Ukraine is not, the faculty will move to a different university if there is competition. This is starting here too. I could imagine living in Lviv and working for UKU, not for Kiev School of Economics. And I also can imagine snatching some people from Oku to Kiev School of Economics. So, but we just need more of that. So, again, it's the incentives of the administrators which matter, not their quality. If you stress the universities and take them away from sort of, you know, this life support of the budget, they will have to look for money. Where will they go? 
They will go to businesses and to the students. Now they will charge students more and the administrators will start thinking not about how to please the rector who will have to please the deputy minister. They'll think about how they can please parents of the children or people themselves, students, who will be willing to pay more than the market. And so they will need to offer them some quality. So immediately they will fire all dead wood and they will try to ac uh, attract good people. And if the administrators are not capable of, they will fire them too. I have no problem firing departments if they don't perform on KPIs. I, I don't have mercy with respect to administration because I have objectives. And the rectors of other universities, when they will be forced to find money from the market, not through political connections, they will be forced to clean up their administration, that they become professionals. So, you know, it's about putting the organizations in stressed <coughs> conditions. Like, we need to stress ourselves if we have plateaued. <coughs> the system of education in Ukraine has plateaued, so it has to be stressed. Other questions? No? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Do you think that uh, lectures like Coursera or Prometheus are completely inefficient in terms of education? No, I like them. I take some of them myself. So I'm just saying that I do not expect them to make me a different person. Combined with something else, combined with my objective to learn something quickly, they might be very useful. Combined with my objective to not learn anything, they're not very useful. That depends on you. Okay, so I'm not saying they, they are a great resource. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm saying you have, you might be, you might need to be committed yourself. You might need to say, well, you know, by 1st January, I'm driving Uber today. I've worked in a bank, someone tells me. By 1st January, I want to be uh, applying to IT companies. For that, I need to do this and this and this. And I'm taking two courses there and two courses there. And I'm talking to someone. And I'm taking an <coughs> internship. I've met a person like that. Very determined, has a plan. Might not be the best plan, might be the best plan, but I've met a person like that. So Coursera, of course, is a great resource. It's for free, good material. Uh, what I was saying is that uh, they don't provide the service which is important for testing, right? You will find a substitute, a book or someone else, a video on YouTube. But of course, Coursera is great. And so is Prometheus and so are other services which are booming in Ukraine. Other questions? Yes. So why uh, did you return to Ukraine after USA? Because you said about comfort zone, and uh, in USA you haven't uh, you hadn't uh, comfort zone, and here you had uh, comfort. Well, there's no comfort zone in USA. Stress, stress is more there. But anyway, uh, the simple answer is I'm crazy. I don't, I'm not adequate uh, fully. I don't understand the consequences. It seemed like fun. Okay. Uh, second, I did not return. I'm not even here. It's a whole, I'm just kidding. I am on leave, and I'm on academic leave. Uh, so I can go back in January. In fact, I'm going for some months back. And whether I come back for another eight months period, it's not clear. I'm interim president. I'm not the permanent president, so I can leave. So I have not given up. I basically, I took an academic leave from, uh, from uh, University of Pittsburgh, where I'm tenured. In order to sort of, it's fun here to see, you know, it's good interesting uh, chance to acquire other skills in an organic matter okay without you know get myself out of comfort zone a little bit and also <coughs> hopefully make some impact you know which is useful uh, after 2013 okay and I feel some there's some responsibility to like a civil responsibility that we can improve the country through education at least that's what I can do that's how I can contribute uh, so th that's all of this is true even some of this is a little bit pathetic or can I come across as, as arrogant, but that's because the American system of, educa of academia protects you. Once you establish your career, it gives you tenure and it guarantees you a salary, and so you can sort of do these things. It is expected of you to do these things. It is expected of you to change things around if you can. So a good professor has to be doing these things. Not necessarily the specific school, you know, maybe doing something else. Okay, but y yes, uh, Th those, you, you want, you, but you know. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll give, uh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Um, you, you, uh, um, uh, you, you know the uh, no American h h higher education system no, um, uh, quite good. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, do you think about disadvantage maybe of American universities or American uh, academic world? It is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. It's very competitive. Kids are stressed. That's good. 
just the <laughs> for those who are strong. Mm. Not stress is not good for everyone. The same degree of stress. So if you're talented and uh, you're aggressive, the U.S. system is good for you. But if you are a little bit uh, prefer a more cooperative take on life, you might be better off in a different system. So it's you know no system is perfect. They have uh, their own issues, and there is also corruption and all kinds of things. You know, it's not human life. It is like humankind is sort of. You know, they're just much richer and much more advanced in time. We probably will be like that eventually. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the American uh, itself, uh, what do they see as the best problem of the higher education? They don't care about problems, you know, it's not their problem. They don't say it's maybe, you know, political <laughs> issues, things like that. They All they want is to get the, the, to the best university, to get the best grades and get the best job. So, you know, it's very individualistic country. People think more about what I can do and what I need to do. They don't care too much about what the country is doing. You know, here in Ukraine, everyone is about, like, is about the government. Who cares about government? I mean, it's like, <coughs> what, what I should care about is where I get new faculty member who is the best, or how, where do I, how do I attract the best students? And you should care about, you know, what is relevant for you? Why do we care about what the government is doing about something? Here, everyone seems to be, you know, everyone cares about corruption. Here. Every, you know, our oligarchs mm -hmm. are corrupt, everyone is like, who cares? You know, if I start worrying how rich people are in Miami and California, I'll be depressed because they are way richer than uh, our oligarchs. Uh, way proportionally much richer than us. It is depressing, and many of them earn their money through some kind of contract. You know, not everyone. You know, there are people who earn through ideas, but a lot of people earn money in you know conceptually similar ways. They do it here, but somehow Americans don't care about that too much. They care about what they can do as long as they you know can earn money. They don't care that someone else earns more. So I would like to see people here saying, well, where is my opportunity to become rich? Rather than saying, those guys are bad. So in that sense, I don't know what Americans think about the system of education. They care about getting out of it as fast as possible so they don't waste time and money on education and get uh, salaries. Yes? Uh, what books would you recommend reading and how to choose a good book? Oh my god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I'm going to give you the list of favorite answer. I don't know. I don't read books. Uh, <laughs> I really don't read books anymore. Last book I, I, I've read, it, and not completely, is Fragile by Design. It's about the political economy of central banking. And I, it's because I teach this course. And I wanted to read this book, so I assigned it to the co course I teach. And in that way, I really am forced to, to read this book. Okay. But I, I cannot, you know, like which I don't know which book. There are so many books. Uh, I watched Narcos the other day, the second <laughs> season, <laughs> like yesterday. I came back and uh, instead of uh, going to bed and sleeping, I decided, you know, I checked Facebook, checked messages, got pissed off at something, and decided to watch Narcos. And you know, seven episodes later, it was morning. Okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. You go ahead. Hello. Uh, do you consider um, environments that uh, university can provide, like the smarter kids, the smarter environment around, mm -hmm. as an extra advantage of high education and the better university uh, you can get in? Uh, because any <coughs> any technology that, uh, like Coursera, Prometheus, books, it can provide you really the smart, the smart environment so which motivates you. You to can have the <coughs> environment and people around you that is important, but I can imagine that this issue can be overcome by Coursera. They can start putting you eventually in groups and connecting you with someone smart on a topic around the world and could be exciting. I don't know, but I could imagine that uh, uh, <coughs> technology will be able to deliver that eventually, maybe not right now. The question, th there are two questions. One is control of the quality. So the, the, the technology, that is just delivering technology. It's not control quality. The, you, you have humans, humans will have to control the quality of education somehow. And the second one is whether the actual personal contact is important. That we do not know, really. At least I do not know. There probably is research. But the jury, I think, is out there anyway. Whether we can become fully engaged with other humans through machines, or do we really have to see humans when we are learning? 
you know, we still go to psychiatrists in developed countries. And as we get more technology, demand is rising. So perhaps there is demand for face-to-face -face interaction. But maybe we'll figure out robots which will resolve that problem. Too. I don't know. For now, you're right. Campuses are important because they not only uh, are sort of efficient places to learn, but they also do two things. One is they bring smart people together, which has externalities. And the second one is... Does it take you from money? Yes, they take you in some different environment. It's not out of comfort. It's not about not out of comfort zone. No, it's just somehow when you know when I go to Odessa, I think differently about things. It takes me out of my regular environment here in Kiev or in Pittsburgh or in New York, and then I have some other ideas which I didn't have. Something else gets activated in my mind. So taking you to campus might be helpful because it resets you in some way. Yes. No other questions? Other questions? Go ahead. <laughs> what is the main difference between students in Pittsburgh and the uh, media school here? I mean, what is the main difference between students? Well, it's an excellent question to which I don't have any reasonable answer. People are so different. You, uh, you know, like two years ago, I would have answered it you know, with some interesting, you know, point. But now I see how... You know, it's just people are different, you know. And even uh, within the school, the people are very diverse. One of the differences is that they are more eager. They're not as cynical as Americans. Americans actually are more cynical. Ukrainians, at least in our school, they are maybe depressed by the country, by the overall style, but they're not cynical yet. They, you know, they're fresh. Uh, Americans tend to be already very pragmatic. And only very few of them can move back and step above this pragmatism and become great. Because in order to become great, you cannot be too pragmatic. You have to be a little bit naive. You want to be able, you want to change the world or to make impact. Uh, because otherwise you never become great. Although I think in top campuses like, uh, again, Harvard, MIT, Yale, you know, this top 10, top 20, there are many more people, they train them like that, that you are the elite which will change the world. Uh, and so all these commencement speeches and opening speeches uh, teach people that. But I think you, you, there is something like that, that uh, some people in, in our school, when we say to them that they can change things in the future, they actually believe it. And uh, that is no guarantee, but that's a necessary condition that they might be able to change something. For everyone student or just for your school students? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not I think it's everywhere in Ukraine. People are fresh. People, so the world, uh, the Ukraine, Ukrainian society is undergoing transformation and people have open eyes. So they today do believe that s some change is possible. They're a little bit frustrated, but they're not excluding it from the set of possibilities. Whereas the, in the American environment or European environments are quite established, quite stable. In fact, it's easier to describe the difference between Americans and Europeans. Europeans don't believe in startups or don't believe that they can become millionaires, whereas Americans think the best thing I can do right now, come up with an idea and you know, have a new startup and sell it to Google. And a lot of people work on that. They come and say, oh, I'm working on this startup or I'm working on that startup. That culture is starting in Ukraine a little bit too. Is good or bad? I think it's good. Anything which encourages people to create is good. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. Да, я помню, я все еще не ответил. А, Юлия, вот Юлия сидит э, в, сзади, вот, 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 да, да, вот поговорим.